Well, I want to thank uh, Craig Walker and Arthur Lee, as well as the NCBH uh, crew and team for uh, inviting me this year to give uh, a couple of talks at this year's meeting. Uh, I'm going to talk about what is IVIS ad and does it improve outcomes when it comes to peripheral interventions. These are my disclosures, nothing pertinent to this presentation. Well, we all know the keys to optimizing interventional therapies include multiple things. You have to have a, a plan. You have to be able to cross the stenosis or a CTO successfully. Vessel prep is important, whether it's scoring balloons or atherectomy. Obviously, accurate sizing of the vessel that's being treated is very important, and in some cases can um, improve patency rates when, when sizing is optimized. We want to obviously treat normal to normal, optimize balloon inflation as well as stent expansion and wall apposition, and we want to limit the amount of contrast we use to really protect uh, patient's renal function. But we do have challenges, especially when you're dealing with different vessel segments. When it comes to the femoral popliteal segment, you're dealing with long CTOs, common, commonly with mixed uh, plaque morphologies. Sometimes about 35% of these are, are calcified. We know there's a high rate of uh, restenosis in the SFA. <clears throat> and a lot of this is really due to mechanical stress from rotation, torsion, as well as lengthening, which can really lead to restenosis or even stent fracture and ISR. When it comes to tibial disease, we know we're dealing with long diffuse stenoses and CTOs. These vessels are typically heavily calcified, especially when you're dealing with diabetics and patients with CKD. And there's some early histologic work indicating cartilage and bone uh, in these vessels. So what are the limitations of angiography? As we all know, angiography is really the gold standard and plays really a critical role when it comes to imaging as well as uh, guiding, guidance uh, during intervention but it does have limitations. We know that angiography provides really a 2D image of a 3D luminal structure. It fails to identify morphology and composition of plaque, fails to accurately determine true vessel size, particularly in CTOs, fails to determine adequacy of intervention in terms of true lumen gain or stent expansion of wall apposition uh, post-therapy, and dissections may appear benign or non-flow limiting despite significant luminal compromise. Obviously, IVIS has limitations as well. Availability is a problem. Not everybody has it. Setup time, there's definitely a learning curve for your, your techs and your nurses and, and crew that you're working with. Image quality is obviously better with an 035 system compared to an 018, but oftentimes getting an 035 system through a CTO or a small tibial vessel is not ideal. Image inter interpretation obviously takes time, and, and there is a learning curve with that. And then there's obviously added costs when using it. But it does have many advantages compared to angiography. The mo it's obviously more accurate for vessel sizing and de determining the true size of an artery that's being treated. It depicts the location of calcium and assesses the plaque morphology and composition much better than angiography. It also shows you the extent of disease because obviously we want to try to treat normal to normal to improve patency rates. And the significance of dissections is definitely much better shown with IBIS than angiography. Uh, higher restenosis rates when we know that there are higher restenosis rates when stents are not sized properly. So IVIS can obviously help with vessel sizing and assessing optimal stent expansion of wall apposition post-treatment. And we know that there's some data now showing improved outcomes with less restenosis at one year following SFA interventions, which are guided by IVIS, including uh, stent placement as well as atherectomy. So what does IVIS tell us? relative to angiography in terms of plaque analysis. Well, this is a nice study that was a prospective study including 93 patients where they basically looked at IVIS versus angiography to determine plaque composition. IVIS was more accurate in determining the vessel diameter and the vessel area stenosis and was also better at determining the severity of calcification compared to angiography. And here's an example of that. If you look at the angiogram on the left side, it doesn't look too bad. Obviously, there's a little bit of plaque, at least angiographically, but when you look with IVIS, you can see really that there are areas of calcification as well as fibrous uh, plaque and uh, significant luminal compromise. And here's another example of IVIS versus angiography. If you look at the angiogram in box A, you can see it looks like there's really no focal hemodynamically significant stenosis. But when you actually look with IVIS, you can see that there's not only significant fibrous plaque, but there's also significant reduction of the lumen. And a lot of this plaque is really fibrous in nature with some areas of necrotic plaque 
and a minimal calcification. So it gives you a much better visualization and analysis of what's really going on in a vessel that you're trying to treat. When it comes to evaluating residual disease, IBIS has also been shown to be better in the SFA. There's another study by Hitchner and his colleagues, 59 pa or, and her colleagues, excuse me, 59 patients. IBIS was feasible and shown to be low risk and better assessing residual disease and adequacy of treatment compared to angiography during SFA interventions. And here's an example of that. If you look at the angiogram in box A, you can see that that looks like a relatively okay angiogram, and this was post-angioplasty. But when you look at the IVIS of that same segment, you can see there's significant atherosclerotic plaque, a few crests of calcification, and significant luminal compromise here. And this resulted in placement of a stent, which again, with post-IVIS evaluation, showed that there was not optimal stent expansion or wall apposition. And so as a result, additional angioplasty was performed, and then the post-IVIS showed a significant improvement. But when you look at the angiogram after the initial stent placement, you can see it looks relatively normal. And so this clearly was missed on angiography, and IVIS really made the difference in terms of visualizing uh, the proper sizing and wall apposition of the stent. So we all know that this is important. The superb trial, which really studied the Supera stent, showed us that proper sizing of stents, limiting compression or elongation in this case, really optimized patency rate. And so we know that that's important. And so there are some studies, as this is data presented at Charing Cross in 2019, which really looked at 43 patients with symptomatic PAD, two blinded investigators, and they, they looked at basically angiography and IVIS, and was there a difference in terms of determining true vessel size for the vessel that they were going to treat. And you can see when you look at this left column that there was a significant undersizing of the angioplasty balloon or stent that was going to be placed based strictly on angiography compared to IVIS. And this was significantly, uh, this was statistically significant. So you can see IVIS is definitely better at determining true vessel diameter. So here's another study that was uh, comparing angiography versus IVIS in determining vessel diameter. This study was a small number of patients, 43 patients retrospectively analyzed. They looked at angiography compared to IVIS. And again, it showed the same conclusion. IVIS offered a greater degree of accuracy in terms of measuring the uh, size of the lumen and the diameter of the lumen compared to angiography, which was consistently underestimating vessel size. And we know that has implications in terms of primary patency rate as well as patency rate of stents, as we've seen in the past. And here's an example of it. If you look at the angiogram to the left, it looks okay. You don't really see anything that looks too suspicious. There's obviously some atherosclerotic plaque there. But when the IVIS is performed, you can see there's a significant atherosclerotic plaque, there's luminal compromise, and there's a stenosis of at least 60 plus percent here. So this resulted in treating this segment of SFA with a six millimeter angioplasty balloon after proper measuring. And although the angiogram looks similar, there was a, a significant improvement post-IVIS. And here's another example. Again, the angiogram, when you look over here, shows that there's some level of atherosclerotic plaque through this segment. But when you look with the IVIS, you can see there's almost an 82% luminal compromise or stenosis with significant atherosclerotic plaque. And on real time, if you look at this video, you can see that this is very complex morphology and plaque composition. So this clearly requires some level of intervention. Whereas here, we might have just done an angioplasty. This may need something like a scaffold to fix it. There was a subgroup analysis of the impact data, uh, which was comparing really DCB versus angioplasty. And Lita et al. wanted to really explore the benefit of using IVIS on patency rate. IVIS was used in about 40% of cases, and what they found was that when IVIS was used, the patency rate was significantly better. It was 71% versus 42% for angioplasty, and 96 versus 85% for DCB at 12 months. So it made a significant difference in this case. What about stent placement in the SFA and popliteal artery? Well, here's a study that was performed comparing really IVIS-directed FEMPOP stent placement compared to angiography guided or non-IVIS guided. And what it showed is that it did result in a, in a significant patency benefit. And if you look, this included 234 patients, 28% was CLI, uh, five-year primary patency rate was 65% in the IVIS group versus 35% in the, the non-IVIS group, with really no change in MAL. And it was really it showed that there was a favorable impact 
due to, again, accurate vessel sizing and being able to stent normal artery to normal artery. Here's some data that was provide, uh, that was really presented by Dr. Spark at Charing Cross in 2018. And again, his team showed the benefit of IVIS plus angiography versus angiography alone when dealing with femoral popliteal interventions. What they did is they conducted a prospective single center RCT to evaluate the benefit of IVIS plus angiography compared with angiography alone for the evaluation and treatment of fempop disease. This, their study included 91 patients relatively equally divided between the IVIS group and the non-IVIS group, with no significant difference in baseline or lesion characteristics between the two groups. And the data again showed that there was a benefit to using IVIS. They showed that the treatment changed in about 80% of cases in the IVIS group. And this included really a change in balloon size, length of treatment zone, and type of treatment as a result of the information that was gained uh, by using the IVIS for imaging. And here you can see, again, they showed a significant difference in primary patency rate in the IVIS group. 83% primary patency rate compared to 63%. So overall, the addition of IVIS, along with good angiography, showed a benefit in terms of more ac accurate vessel sizing, extent of disease, and patency rate. Here's another study of IVIS related to directional atherectomy. Most of us do angiography uh, on a daily basis, and usually our directional atherectomy is guided by angiography alone. But this is a retrospective study, 114 patients by PK and his, and his team at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, and they showed that <clears throat> of the 46 patients who had IVIS-guided directional atherectomy, they had a significantly lower C, clinically driven TLR rate of 18% versus 51% when it was guided by angiography alone. And this was at 12 months. And as a result of their data, they concluded that the lack of IV gu guidance uh, to be a significant predictor of clinically driven TLR at 12 months based on their regression analysis. So again, IVIS guided intervention was showing a, a benefit here when you're dealing with FEMPOP instant restenosis. There's also a correlation in terms of dissections. Here's another study, small study, about 15 patients where they used IVIS to evaluate uh, de novo FEMPOP stenoses and non-stent restenosis after atherectomy in patients. IVIS images were obtained at baseline after atherectomy and after additional uh, balloon angioplasty. IVIS showed a significantly uh, larger number of dissections in this case, post-atherectomy versus angiography. And post uh, additional angioplasty, IVIS also saw a significant increase in the number of dissections compared to angiography alone. And so IVIS here was better at really determining the extent, circumference, and depth of dissections compared to angiography alone. And overall, dissections after atherectomy were seen to be underappreciated by angiography alone compared to IVIS. So let's look at some examples. If you look at the image on the left, this is an angiogram without significant flow limitation uh, on real-time imaging. And it looks pretty good on even a static image. You don't really see a significant dissection. But when you look at the IVIS image to the right, you can see there's not only a significant arterial dissection, but there's also significant luminal compromise. And this, I, I would argue, impacts patency rate and may result in thrombosis at some point. Here's another angiogram. On the left, you can see it looks pretty good, a little bit of plaque, but doesn't look like a significant focal stenosis or even a dissection flap. But again, when you look to the right and look at this IVIS image on the right, you can see there's not only a significant dissection, there's luminal compromise, and then there's a combination of uh, soft and calcified atherosclerotic plaque. So again, therapy has not been optimized here. And here's another example. If you look at this angiogram, you can see that clearly there's a dissection in the popliteal artery. However, it's not flow limiting there doesn't seem to be any holdup of contrast as it's flowing. There's good wash in, good wash out. But when you look with IVIS, you can see there's not only a significant dissection flap, but there's also significant luminal compromise. And so this was a patient where it took almost, uh, you know, a couple hours to recanalize an occluded popliteal artery as well as two tibial vessels. The last thing you want to do is leave this alone and then have the patient occlude in a short period of time. And you can see the difference after a stent was placed in terms of the angiographic result, and there was no luminal compromise on, on post-therapy IVIS. Here's another example 
of proximal SFA disease treated with angioplasty. Again, you can see there's some luminal compromise or a stenosis here, but it doesn't look that bad. But when you look with IVIS in the video on the right, you can see there's not only luminal compromise, but there is a significant dissection flap with uh, a large false lumen narrowing the true lumen. So this really needs therapy. As a result, tacks were placed to take care of this. And you can see now on the post tack placement, there is res there's resolution of the dissection flap and there's improvement of the caliber of the artery. And again, there's the final angiogram to the right. So finally, what about IVIS utilization and amputation rate as well as complication rates? Here's an analysis that was performed on 90 th about 92,000 patients uh, from the National Inpatient Sample Database, and they were really looking at all the patients between the years of 2006 and 2011. And what they looked at was in-hospital mortality, amputation, and complications after treatment in patients in which IVIS was utilized. So they really studied about 1,200 patients. Their analysis really showed a lower rate of amputation in the IVIS group and showed that really IVIS was independently predictive of a lower rate of post-procedure complications as well as a lower amputation rate without any impact on in-hospital mortality. So again, showing the benefits of using IVIS. So in summary, we know that angiography is the gold standard for diagnostic imaging and intervention in PAD, but there's compelling data showing that IVIS is better than angio in terms of vessel sizing, determining the degree of stenosis, assessing plaque morphology and composition, showing residual disease and extent of disease, in other words, treating normal to normal, pre and post therapy, demonstrating dissections in terms of luminal compromise, significance and extent, and IVIS has been shown to be better at showing optimal stent expansion and wall apposition compared to angiography. And we know that IVIS guided interventions result in a higher patency rate with regard to DCBs, FEMPOP artery stent placement, and directional atherectomy for FEMPOP ISR. And there is some data showing a lower amputation rate and complication rate. Uh, thank you. And uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting me for this uh, lecture.